1 p.m. And I'm actually going to call the, first I'm going to make a chair statement. Um, this meeting is be re being recorded by the Economic Development Council. If any other person present is doing the same, you must notify the chair at this time. Anyone else? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna call the roll. Um, Councilor, uh, President Gilmore. Here. Um, Councilor Elmer. Here. And Councilor DeSorger is present and Vice President Gwynn is not here. I, I do not think that he is coming tonight. <clears throat> um, I wanna start this meeting by uh, welcoming our invited guests and saying we actually all have the same goals here. Um, there is a facility operating now at 298 Federal Street. It is doing very good and desperately needed work in our community. Um, uh, questions have arisen on um, on the, the timing of the sale in light of the remediation process. In consideration of our expert witnesses, we will start with them so that they do not have to stay for the entire meeting unless they choose to do so. Um, I checked with Clerk Scott Questions and comments may only be asked by sitting council members of the Economic Development Committee. For tonight, that would be President Gilmore, Vice President Gwynn, Council Elmer, and myself. I will read into the record all questions submitted to department heads and the city attorney, uh, Gregory Schmidt, and their answers if they were, if in, if they were provided, um, and their answers if they were provided. Welcome to Jennifer Hoffman, our Board of Health Director and thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, so um, my, my first question to you is, has the Board of Health been involved in the previous cleanup efforts at the Lunt property to, to, your not, to the best of your knowledge? The Board of Health, I would have to look back on minutes to see if that was the case. Um, but the health department was involved in an information receiving sense. So the health department received notifications from the Massachusetts, um, mm -hmm. Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and some uh, stuff from, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from Weston and Sampson, OTO, Tegan Bond, and some emails. But basically it was in an information gathering Way. Okay. Thank you. Um, what, one concern that was raised um, was the opening of a, a new facility over a partially remediated site and filling a treatment center with staff and patients prior to checking for vapor intrusion of TCE. To the best of your experience, is it the best practice to check an area for safety prior to allowing occupancy. So based on the records that we have on file, um, there were multiple air samples taken um, because the, D the Massachusetts DEP uh, wanted them to be. The last uh, measurement we have on record um, was March 2nd of 2017 under the worst case conditions um, and the numbers were not elevated significantly at that point. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Goley's garage and several residences on Kenwood and, and Forest Street did have elevated um, levels of VOC. They were checked once. Um, where the concentration of TCE has increased in the catch basins um, on Kenwood Street. Do you think that these residences and businesses should be rechecked in your opinion? Um, well, the health department um, had samples on Kenwood Street taken by the DEP asked for samples to be taken. 
Um, mm -hmm. And they did not have elevated levels of TCE. They did find benzene, as you mentioned. Um, however, I just want to make note that Goalie's Garage has had multiple EPA and DPE cita D <clears throat> DEP citations and notifications for noncompliance, ranging from 1993 to 2010, which were petroleum spills releasing oil and hazardous materials into the groundwater. Um, and since it's still an active garage, that could still be the case. So I, I think on a health department standpoint, it would be difficult to say where this benzene is actually coming from since they're directly across the street from each other. And I think that needs to be looked into a little further. Thank you. I did, I did read that. Yes, uh, Councilor Elmer. Yes, um, I'm wondering if it would be helpful to uh, look at some graphics uh, just to zero in on what property we're talking about and uh, where the remediation was done. Um, would this be a, I could share them on my screen. Would, with your permission, I would do that, but. Well, that would be great, um, Councillor Elmer. That would be great okay, if you would me, do that to show me, the area. Let me, me see if I can do that. Bear with me. Can you see this? No, not, not yet. yet. Uh, I was trying to share the screen. Show me in front of the presentation. Share. It's, oh, coming. it's coming up now. Okay, let me go back to, uh, okay, this, this is the location we're talking about, the former Lunt uh, Silversmith property. Uh, um, these are the buildings. Uh, some of them have been torn down. I can make it a little bigger, might be helpful. Thank um, you. And uh, this is, these are the sampling uh, sites, monitoring wells and indoor air sampling sites. As you can see, a lot of sampling was done. Um, uh, I'm not sure what this shows. So these are, but uh, what I found most interesting was this. Mm -hmm. um, the pink is the area that was remediated uh, Limit of method one exceedance in groundwater. Uh, this this is where I thought this is where the groundwater was affected. Uh, these are the neighboring houses, and uh, we actually have readings uh, over time for many of these sites. Uh, I can try to bring one of those up. Not so easy. The, uh, soil exposure. Uh, uh, actually, Councilor Disorder, you're more familiar with these than I am. Uh, but I can, for example, uh, what are we looking at? The That's tri -chlor ty uh, TCE, trichloroethylene, was always the biggest problem. Uh, as I understand the chemistry, it binds to organic molecules like the, the mulch in soil. Uh, it doesn't evaporate by itself, but as soil off gases, it carries the TCEs with it. Now, <clears throat> what's important here is the green versus the white. Uh, you can see the dates of the reading, 721, 16, 8, 19, 16, 3, then 2017. After the green area are the readings after a passive system was put in place. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Director Warner, but I, my understanding was it was a gravel layer with an impermeable layer over it. So the idea was that would prevent the off gassing of uh, TCEs. And you can see that the levels that were at like four point, an important. Uh, factor here is the the 
Uh, the levels that are allowed by the, EP, uh, the EPA uh, for residential indoor air is 0 0.4 and for commercial indoor air is 1.8. Mm -hmm. uh, and before uh, this layer was put on, uh, you had readings like 4.7, which is way over even the commercial limit. Afterwards, I believe what happened is it got down below the commercial allowable commercial or industrial use, uh, but it's still above the residential use, which is important because the question of whether this is <laughs> considered a, a commercial property or a residential uh, is, a, is a legal distinction that uh, is relevant and, and um, what's the word, uh, important. Uh, and uh, I, I believe the city's position is that because this is uh, a treatment facility, it, it falls into the category of commercial. Uh, so, that, so that in these, le I think maybe this is what uh, Director Hoffman was talking about. These are acceptable levels uh, for commercial operation. Uh, that, that, this helped me to see these numbers uh, in understanding what's going on. Um, so I stop sharing. Is there something Actually, else you want to show? I have a question about this graph. So yeah. the very, very last white column, it's January 19th. No, 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 I'm sorry. Um, if you scoot, yeah. So right before that uh, passive system that was put in place, that was the lowest it ever was. See, that's point, uh, point four nine. if I'm reading that right. Yeah. I know I'm looking at a really small screen, so I could be oh, I could be wrong. You know, that's, you're reading it correctly. I'll make them a little bigger. Yeah, that's perfect. So why was it? It was at its lowest before that passive system was put in place. And then you can see that after the system was put in place that it stayed much lower than it was prior. But I don't understand why it was there was this significant drop between March of 2017 and January of 2018 and then a slight increase in February of 2018. Is there anyone who can make sense of that? Uh, I could make a guess, perhaps, perhaps uh, Director Hoffman knows better. I, I think it's the weather. Mm -hmm. um, one was taken in March and one was taken in January. Uh, and then later these things were taken in, in the middle of the summer, the fall, and then in February again. So uh, probably you should compare month to month uh, for a fair comparison, but I have no idea. <laughs> Just guessing. It, I, I actually did read that it is dependent on what season it is, whether you know whether the windows are open, closed. But um, I don't see that they were. I do not see that they're within n n the normal range, even for commercial. In in the second one, the, uh, the green second, yeah in the green. I'm, 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 not, yeah, I'm not talking about the normal range. It just mm -hmm. seems like that was that was our best point, mm -hmm. and that was before it. Had, and I'm I'm not saying that the system made it worse, but it seems like you know we went two point one, one point seven, four point seven, zero point four, and then it went up to zero point nine, zero point two. Do, do you see what I'm yeah. saying right there? Yeah. I was just wondering if someone had an explanation for that, but I don't feel like a lot of windows would have been open in January. Unless it was a very diff different January than we're having today. Right. Uh, I think, I think the answer is we don't know. Okay. We will have it. Um, we'll have someone else who can give us a little bit more expertise into that in a little bit. Um, but thank you very much for sharing that screen. Oh, if that's helpful. the case, just if that's the case, just tell me to save my question. I can wait. Very good. We'll save that for a little bit. Um, There's one thing. I, if, while I've got the screen here, let me just show mm -hmm. this one last thing. This is from the EPA. Uh, this is their <laughs> report on how well uh, the remediation was going. This is a uh, 2018, September of 2018. And I don't know if you can see it, but uh, their con uh, 
there were concerns, site contaminants impacting indoor air. It was still happening as of 2018. That, that was a concern. And, I mean, I don't really understand because I would think that the e, it's the EPA's job to blow the whistle or crack down or, or stamp their feet, whatever they do, insist that something gets done. Uh, but I don't see, um, I, I, this is the last I've heard, seen from them. Um, I, I had, can I ask, a, well, let, let me stop there. I, I actually had a question about, there was a, a use limitation report that was supposed to be issued. Uh, MJ, are you here? I just have a Can quick question on? about that graph. Sure. Yeah. Um, when it says site contaminants impacting indoor air, which contaminants are these? It doesn't state what the contaminants yeah. are. So I'm just wondering, was it TCE or was it benzene or other types of contaminants that were elevated? Yeah, I'm just looking and scrolling through to see. The, the TCEs in most of these documents are identified as the main problem. Um, so I assumed they were talking about TCEs, but I don't know. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that based on other contaminants they found that could be from other sources. Okay. Okay, good. That's helpful. Thanks. I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think they were referring to the trichloroethylene because that's what was elevated in the previous chart. If you want to go back to that. We, uh, we, it would be great to hear from the EPA directly um, uh, on this. I don't know if they've been invited. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, thank right. you for letting me. Oh, I did have that one question for MJ Adams, if I could. Uh, in the minutes, uh, which we were supposed to approve, uh, it says that, that the use limitation report was going to be issued. Uh, last I heard was that they were still working on it. There's a document in this file. Uh, let me just point to something. Th these are the files about this property that are publicly searchable. Uh, and uh, the last file is a, is a request for a delay for six months uh, from the company that's working for the city uh, so that they don't have to report till next spring. They were supposed to report it already. Anyway, just, give, just to give you a feel of what is there, which, which uh, Councilor Disorder has been pouring over for some time, which I've tried to familiarize myself in the last week. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Oh, and so MJ, do you know whether that report has been prepared? I haven't seen it. Uh, I do know that um, our our licensed site professional, um, Bruce Nickerson was working on it. Is he on, If was he invited this evening and is he here this evening? He was in, invited this evening and he is not here. He would be the one who would be able to give you the, the most recent uh, status report yeah. on that. Except I also have the answer. Oh, <laughs> great, Mayor. <laughs> Do you want the answer? <laughs> um, the activities and use limitation, it, excuse me, <laughs> inconvenient. The activities and use limitations uh, is complete, and um, there is a 30-day period before they file it. Um, I have not waived that period at this point, but I I have the authority to waive it. The request has been made, but in my discussions with, uh, and I had, wasn't expecting that particular question, so I can't tell you what date I got it, but it was very, re it was fairly recently. It was last week, I believe, um, that um, it's, um, I was told by, uh, Ray for Pel Pellegrino that it, he could care less whether, I mean, he could wait for the 30 days. That wasn't a big issue for him. So um, as I understand the process, um, the activities and use limitation can be um, filed and, and will be filed at some point in the very near future. <clears throat> Thank you. The Mayor. sooner I yes. if I waive that 30 day waiting period, which I'm frankly not sure what we're waiting for, but um, 
if I waive it, then it'll be filed. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for mm -hmm. answering that. I know that it has not yet been filed. No. Um, it's not, it, it is not uh, on the EPA list of submitted documents. It usually no. frequently accompanies the sale of a purchase. Yeah. Uh, could, if so I on, could. Yes, go ahead. Add to that. The, the, the relevance of that is that, um, well, A, I, I don't know if they've, uh, if they are actually still testing the air, uh, but they're, there uh, might be limitations in what uh, what people can use this property for. Like, if the basement has a lot of, of uh, TCEs in it, uh, maybe the use limitation would say you can't use the basement. Uh, so that's that's why I think it's, uh, I would like to see it. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say there. All righty. Well, let's go back to um, let's go back to Director Hoffman so that. Um, so that she can have the rest of her evening off, should she so choose. Um, to, um, Director Hoffman, to the best of, of your knowledge, was that the, the DPW was responsible for emptying the catch basins. Do you think that they should have been alerted that there were um, high levels of TCE in the groundwater in those catch basins? Yeah, I'm Sorry about that. I don't claim to be an expert in environmental health, so I'm really not sure exactly at what point the DPW should have been informed. But I think the best person you should ask is the person in charge of the DPW. They would have better answers than I would. For that. Very good. Um, and lastly, on the um, does the the this is concerning the Board of Health and um, your involvement in the public involvement plan. Um, uh, did Board of Health, does the Board of Health plan to become involved in the public involvement plan and would the Board of Health need to secure an outside consultant? Just any thoughts that you have actually, um, to be less formal, any thoughts that you have on the um, public involvement plan? Um, Director Hoffman. Thank you. Um, the health department, like I said earlier, is basically receives information and, the, and basically that's the role in the PIP at that point notifications. And that's just a, a CMR code uh, could be made orally or in writing. And basically every written notice has to be submitted to the department of health. The board of health, um, if they, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't, like I said, I could look up the minutes in previous. I could look up to see if it was brought up to the health department's attention, board of health's attention in the past, because I've just, I, I wasn't there when this was all happening. But as for securing outside expertise, um, based on my experience with the board at this point, um, I am not aware. I would think the Board of Health would have to review the ordinance saying that they can hire an outside consultant first, and the Board of Health would want to do that. Um, they would review the records that we have on file based on what I just know how the board operates, um, and then they would see what steps need to be taken. Um, they would have a meeting and needed to discuss the findings and the ordinance, um, and they would discuss their viewpoints and vote. However, Based on that, I can't say how the board would or would not um, decide or vote on. Um, that would be up to the board. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for, um, do any other councilors have questions for Director Hoffman? who's giving up another evening in the middle of a pandemic. So thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you. Tonight. Um, did anybody else have any other questions for her? Councilor Elmore or Council Gilmore, President Gilmore? All set, thank you. All right, I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much for inviting me tonight. I really appreciate it. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am, 
I'm going to just read into the record one question and answer from um, Director uh, from uh, uh, Marla Warner, the uh, DPW director. And the question to him was, um, he was not able to be here tonight because he had another meeting. And the question to him was, were you ever notified that the catch basins on Kenwood Street had high levels of contaminants? And Director Warner's answer was, before I left the city in February of 2016, and since my return in October of 2018, I am unaware of any notifications to the DPW. I cannot speak to the time frame in which I was not here, end quote. So- Is that time frame significant to this project? Like would the notification have happened during that time frame when he was absent? Um, some of, there were definitely readings that happened, high readings that happened in the time period that he was here. And some of them, there was, um, there were some of them that occurred while he was not here. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, there was a, an alert to the deep, there was an alert that was sent out that, that uh, required a two hour response. Do you mm -hmm. remember when that was? Yes, that was in um, August of 2016, shortly after right. they opened. And that, that was an air sampling that was high and that and it was high enough that uh, the law says you have to let the, the state know. Yes. Do and, that right? and when that happens, the fire chief is notified, the board of health is notified, the mayor is notified. Um, and I am, there's a list of parties that are notified. I'm not sure that the DPW is one of them. I did not see them on that list. So I have a question for anyone present. If there's a notification like that, and then we've got obviously, you know, some turnover in that period. Um, is there a record of it somewhere? Like if Director Willett, former Director Willett had this information, would we have any way of knowing that? Or would it just be someone called him or said, could anyone sort of? Typically, uh, uh, I'll answer. Typically those, at least in my experience, uh, whenever in most of these cases, by the way, the mayor is not me. <laughs> um, but um, most of the times they're written, they're very formal written notifications that we get mm -hmm. sent um, in the, it, well, sometimes we get an email and subsequently the hard copy version, which is timestamped. So various records um, do exist. Uh, from what I understand from my discussions with Marlo, um, they, the records left by Mr. Roulette are a little wanting in information. So it would, he's on limited duty as you may or may not know. So it would require him to go back and look through those records to kind of answer that question. But um, they are somewhat limited. And I would, I would say the same about uh, my office. I don't see, I have, bits and pieces of files that were left behind. Jennifer probably has the most exhaustive file. Thank you, Mayor. Going Thank way you. Back, Thank going you. way back. And then, and when I say exhaustive, only as, it, in her case, only as it related to the Board of Health and what, what the Board of Health received. Right. It's not Thank you. Everyone. I, thank you very much. Um, I see Lyons Wittens is here with us tonight. And I see that you had your hand up. Um, Lyons is a licensed site professional, um, a hydrologist and an engineer from OHI Engineering. And I think he has expertise in this field. I think that you had your hand up perhaps to answer that. Is that correct, Lyons? That's correct. So the, the notifications are required to be sent to the uh, chief municipal officer, the mayor, and the board of health. Or the health department, depending. Those those two offices are are where notifications are required to be sent, and they're uh, written. Um, 
nowadays it, it's permissible that email counts as a written communication. But there are written right, in a written form. Very good. Of course, mass DEP, but copies go to the mayor and the Board of Health. Thank you very much. So Lyons will be the person to whom that we can ask any of those specific questions that um, that we had. Um, and I first want to thank you for also for coming tonight. And um, perhaps you could explain it in general a little bit about um, the the VOCs, the pathway of migration, um, and why this would be something of concern. Would you care to take tackle that? Well, there are several classes of contaminants at this site. One are the um, chlorinated volatile organic compounds, um, notably the uh, trichloroethylene, TCE. Um, there's a few others, but the TCE is the big one. Um, and that is a concern for groundwater and indoor air because it's a volatile compound. Um, that means it can evaporate. And so even in groundwater, uh, it volatilizes into the soil and then rises up through the soil and can get into buildings much the way that uh, radon gets into our homes. So the VOCs do the exact same thing. Um, and many of the, the passive mitigation system that was installed in several of the buildings here um, is designed after the radon mitigation systems of the 1980s. They enter buildings the same way and the solution is remarkably similar, effective. Um, the other contaminants you have at this site are metals and they are primarily in soil and they're not anywhere near the ingestion, uh, inhalation risk. It's a, a dermal contact with soil. So kids, kids playing in the yard or people gardening, um, touching the soil then you get dermal contact through the skin and some dust, but it's, uh, there are two different classes of contaminants in two different media um, and they need to be and are being treated separately. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as to the uh, map that uh, the gentleman was showing earlier uh, with the pink area, that is the area where groundwater's I'm sorry. Hold on just a second. Time for my plants to go to bed. <laughs> um, that is the area where uh, groundwater has been impacted by volatile organic compounds. Um, and it goes from the former manufacturing locations um, south towards the road and is being intercepted by the sewer system um, conveniently. And so most of it is entering the sewer system and leaving the property. Uh, so in this case, the solution to pollution is dilution sewer. Um, that's not necessarily correct or permissible, but it it's the reality of what's happening at the moment. Uh -huh. And so the homes on the other side of Kenwood are receiving far less impact than they would otherwise because of the sewer. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. The, the uh, early on in one of the documents I looked at, they talked about the solution being a slab with an active, some kind of active system. It sounded like for moving the air out from underneath. What was put in place was something different. It sounded like if, if I got that right, it's a, the passive system is just putting a cover over it and it doesn't have an active, uh, I don't know, air uh, moving of air. Is that right? It's essentially the same thing without a fan. 
okay. you can take the passive system they have now and install a fan or a blower on it and exhaust the air that's underneath the building. Mm -hmm. If I could follow up. And that would that would lower indoor air concentrations um, dramatically, uh, but it would also um, likely prevent the city from being able to close the property with DEP, um, or at least uh, require long-term monitoring um, for the effectiveness of that and. Uh, there would have to be quite a bit of testing prior to being able to shut it down. So it would have to run for quite a while. Um, that would be a better solution than the one that exists now. Passive system. In the risk assessment that's being done, um, the piece that I've seen in the phase two report from, I think it's April of 2020, the report you were showing pictures and graphs from, um, is the most recent thing that has any data in it or any analysis of data. Uh, the risk assessment in that says that the indoor air quality uh, passes muster. I would I would say that technically it might if you do a lot of rounding, um, but a, from the measure it passes a straight face test um, of saying, oh, we have we have patients in a building with indoor air quality issues. Um, how can we expect those patients to recover? They're, they're not the vibrant, healthy, you know, 20 year old marathon runner. Um, we're talking about people with substance abuse who are trying to recover and trying to get better and you're housing them in a in a facility that has compromised air. Um, anyway, that's so the risk assessment that's being published, that's being used to close the site and write the activity and use limitation, says um, that everything is clean enough, and that there will be no residential use of the property. And I would argue that ninety-day rehab facility stays are. Um, are a residential use, and if your clientele includes women of childbearing age, specifically pregnant women, um, then there is very definitely uh, potential exposure to the fetus, and whoever's in charge of this facility is um, leaving themselves open to environmental liability in the form of lawsuits. So um, I don't claim to know the, the clientele, um, but I've read that the stays in the facility are up to 90 days. And uh, I know from uh, friends and family uh, experience that um, one stay in a rehab facility is not always uh, the only one. Um, so may not, may not just be a 90 day stay at any rate. Um, mm -hmm. did you have specific questions? Yes, go ahead. I do, but go ahead. Council Elmer. Uh, I just, um, I think maybe at this point we should, uh, say something about the context of this meeting. Uh, according to the town, according to the uh, the town's lawyer, uh, the council has no say in this. That they signed a contract with the the uh, the owner, uh, who the people who've been running the facility who want to exercise the owners. They want to buy it. Uh, that was the part of the deal, and we've been told that. Uh, that if we interfere with that sale in any way, uh, the town could be sued. I'll, I'll take that. I'll assume that that's correct. Uh, the reason we're having this meeting is because the council was presented uh, with two uh, conflicting opinions. According to the town, uh, 
the facility has been remediated and the sale can go through according to you and that we're, I see Glenn Ayers is here, uh, also has some expertise here. Uh, uh, we're here, we heard that the, that the facility was not uh, safe. Uh, so the purpose of this meeting is to try to get to the, to the hear both sides of that. Uh, and unfortunately we don't have some of the people, uh, we don't have the lawyer, for example, the mayor seems to have left. Um, uh, the, the people arguing that it is safe are not fully represented here, uh, but but I think it's important that we hear what what the risks are. Uh, whether we have power or not, we certainly have the right to of oversight and uh, to respond to constituents' concerns. Um, so I just wanted to sort of state that. But thank you. You've been very helpful. Um, thank you, Phil. Um, Lyons, uh, in, in your opinion, um, as far as the site assessment, um, a comprehensive site assessment, um, has the site been, in your opinion, has the site been studied enough to delineate the extent of the contamination? Um, and we can pull that screen, that, that uh, slide up again with the pink outline in it if that helps you, but perhaps it doesn't. No, no you don't need that. Uh, Go ahead. It might help other people, but uh, certainly um, quite a bit of testing has been done. Um, I would argue that with ongoing construction, um, not enough indoor air testing has been done specifically in, in unit B1. Um, they did a year's worth of quarterly testing uh, twice in the winter, twice in February, and twice other times of the year. Um, and some of those results pulled up some higher than you'd like results. Uh, overall, when they're all averaged together, it comes out okay in the risk assessment. Um, but it, it's marginal in my opinion. And um, the last testing was in 2018 and construction has been ongoing. So um, that's an issue that I don't personally feel comfortable with. Um, the, the groundwater issue has been fairly well studied in that they, they know where um, it's coming from and where it's going. It's going into the sewer. There's not much resolution as to what should be done about that uh, and whether that can continue. And I, I don't know that DEP will agree that the, the current situation of groundwater discharging to sewer and then uh, evaporating over time before it reaches the Green River is okay uh, or not. Um, it, it could be a, a site of the, the release tracking number, the file at DEP could be reopened over that issue. It could be reopened over indoor air quality. Um, the soil, I think, is is being taken care of as they do construction, and I have less concern about the metals in the soil than I do uh, the volatiles in the groundwater and indoor air. Um, and initially, they had proposed a um, an active SSDS with um, that would improve with, indoor air quality. Pardon? That the, the, the table um, that Mr. Gilmore had with uh, the blue and the green. Right. Uh, the green numbers would go way down if that was an active system. That, right. That would help indoor air quality dramatically. Well, it's not that a passive would, system. So it what it means is that that. The whole sub slab, you know, they put gravel down in the basement and they covered it with a little plastic and then concrete. Um, and there's a pipe that comes up out of that and goes up through the roof. So any vapors that are under the slab find the easy way out, like all other things, and they go up the pipe and out the roof, they're gone. Um, if you put a fan on that, then they're, the vapors are drawn to the pipe 
and what escapes around the edges and through the plastic and up through the slab is far, far less. The problem is you're stuck in a regulatory um, cycle where you need to do testing and you need to do extensive testing before you're allowed to turn the fan off um, and, and discontinue its use. So they tried really, really, really hard to not put a fan on it because they didn't want to get stuck in that loop. Um, they've argued successfully, at least on paper, that that is acceptable and it's okay and there's no risk. Um, it remains to see whether DEP will agree with that when they audit the closure. But putting a fan on it would would help dramatically and you know, if the new owner needs to run the fan and do the testing, so be it. Uh, they're getting a lot. They're getting a lot from the town when they buy the site. They could they could do that, and that would that would allevi alleviate most of my concerns about indoor air quality to uh, the patients and the mm -hmm. staff, for that matter. Are there any residential staff at this facility or is everybody uh, it's just day workers or you know shift workers? I am not aware of I don't I'm not aware of the staff. I know they had staff around the clock, but right um, yeah. I do know that they were in there for uh, a year and a half before we put in the PE PPM. A year and a half after that two hour I, uh, high level. Yeah. Um, yes, Councilor Elmer. You're, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah. I have uh, an engineering question. Maybe you can't answer it. But uh, is it too late to replace the passive system with an active system that would be more effective? Um, no, it's. About the simplest thing you could do out there. All you have to do is cut the pipe and put a fan in it. It's a twenty dollar fan or a sixty dollar fan, and you know, take somebody an hour and a half to put in and and plug in, unless you need to bring electricity to there. And it would take a little longer, but it would be the least expensive thing they do out there, and it would be the the biggest bang for your buck. But then you're stuck yeah. in a in a monitoring cycle that does cost money long term. And it goes on for how long? How long do you have to monitor? I don't know. How long do you think the groundwater is going to be impacted and and okay. give off volatiles into the building? It could be years. I'm I'm going to um, interrupt I, I install and several systems in Greenfield for exactly this kind of chemical and those systems, some of them have been running for 12 years and they're still not cleaned up. Um, it's protecting the indoor air. O'Reilly, Talbot, and Oaken, for which Bruce Nicholson is the LSP, I'm reading directly from their report. This is what they proposed for this, their long-term operation and maintenance. It's just a couple of sentences. The groundwater and vapor intrusion interception approaches outlined above will need to operate indefinitely. Costs for required monitoring, reporting, electricity, and routine maintenance are likely... <coughs> On the order of thirty thousand dollars a year, assuming a twenty-year time frame, um, the present worth of the uh, O and M monitoring program would have been uh, is estimated at two hundred thousand dollars. We are not doing that right now, but that is something that they did propose uh, in one of their earlier submissions, and that did did not happen. But were that happening uh, with the active monitoring? Um, and active testing, we'd have a better idea of how clean the air actually was. You would agree with that? It'd be right. much cleaner. The indoor air would be much cleaner. The, the right. values in the green parts of that chart would be far low. It would be the lowest ones that you'd see anywhere on the chart instead of mm -hmm. just less than the highs that you see on the chart now. Right. Passive systems doing something, but it's it's not highly effective. It's barely effective, in my opinion. 
Um, do you have any concerns about the, the um, control or the migration of the TCEs offsite to the down gradient properties from what you've read? From what I've read, um, the down gradient properties are not being impacted in a way that will concern DEP. That will concern DEP. There is, there is some minor impact, but it's it's not enough to make DEP um, make uh, whoever the owner is take action. Okay. Um, I had I had one more concern about the. Um, the actual locus of the remediation site. There's a very high water table. And on the north side um, in Norwood Street, there's a sump pump that's operating um, on the site. Maybe you can pull up that. Uh, maybe you can pull that up, Phil. Um, there's a sump pump that's operating on the north side on Norwood Street, and there were very elevated levels there. I I have concerns about the actual. Yes, um, you maybe you can point to where I mean, Councilor Elmer. Yes, right up there. Um, for some reason, did it, it was decided that this would be the focus of the remediated area. And the indoor air in where Council Elmer has the cursor right now there was very high. And so were the um, groundwater and soil gas just adjacent to that. I don't know why it didn't encompass all of the buildings, including unit A. But is isn't a high water table, isn't that something that um, increases the, the risk of migration? Am I correct with that, Lyons? High water table simply means it's close to the ground surface. Mm -hmm. um, what that means is that the groundwater is closer to whatever the lowest floor of the building is, whether it's the basement floor or the slab. Um, and the uh, DEP's regulatory limit or interest um, with volatile organics in groundwater is when groundwater is 15 feet or less from the ground surface. So it's, it's shallow groundwater if it's 15 feet or less down to water. Um, which it certainly is at this site. It's right six or eight feet or less. Very shallow, very shallow groundwater. So, um, and that's because that's the distance that is easiest for volatiles to travel and still get into a building. So, but groundwater is pretty close to the basement floor here, so it, right. it's almost no distance at all. So do, so do you find, because I found it surprising that we weren't checking the catch basins on Norwood Street uh, or, or looking, and, and unit A1, um, well, I'm not really sure of what things are underground, but there are, I'm not sure of how those buildings are connected underground, but they were all connected with hallways, et cetera. Am I out in left field thinking that? Am I out in left field thinking that perhaps all of those buildings should have been checked or or not? I'm uh, happy to hear. I don't, you know. I don't think they need to check the catch basins in Norwood Street because their groundwater levels up there were low enough that they wouldn't. And 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 the overall direction of groundwater flow is to the south toward Kenwood Street, so it the um, the overall flow of groundwater would be toward the south, so the contaminants would go with the water. Um, I don't know how the buildings. I don't know how the buildings are interconnected uh, in the basement level. Um, if if they're two separate basements and there's doors between them to close, um, that can be enough to keep 
indoor air problems within one building and not allow it to go into the next. Okay. Unit A1 is now the Center for Transitional Assistance. And I, yes, Unit A1. And, and me, um, but I, I, I'm just, I just found it interesting the way that the pink curve went. I don't know why all of the buildings wouldn't have been checked. Um, uh, they may have been checked for indoor air, but the, the long, the multiple rounds of testing were done on um, B1, B2, and, and C. Because okay. that's where the groundwater issues were. And they, and they found the table nine that we were looking at earlier with the blue and the green mm -hmm. columns in it um, um, show that they're, you know, they're, there are chlorinated solvents. There we go. That one. There are chlorinated solvents in um, in the indoor air. Um, if you go to the first row, the upper ones. Mm -hmm. There you go. You look right. at, uh, the one in the middle, first floor office, room one hundred eight. Um, all of the numbers in the green. Almost all of them. 2.2, they're, they're higher yeah. than the 1.8 commercial indoor air threshold value. Um, the threshold values in this, in this table are values above which DEP wants you to do indoor air sampling um, and evaluate it. I mean, these are air samples, but um, to evaluate it in a risk assessment. And they, they took these numbers and they put them in a method three risk assessment and they came out with uh, a result that says no significant risk. Um, it's borderline, um, but on paper it works and it's gonna be hard to argue with mass DEP that, that there isn't a risk. But these green, the values, sorry, I'm pointing at my own screen. Um, <laughs> The values in green would be a tenth of that if they had an active system in place. If they put a fan on this, you know, they, they spent, I don't know, $10,000 putting in a passive system, uh, lots of concrete and pipes and pipes up through the roof and everything else. Um, it would have cost $30,000 a year to do monitoring, so they didn't do that. And it's like, let's, let's see if we can get away without it. Well, the numbers say they can get away without it, but if they if they put a fan on it, it would be far more effective and the indoor air quality would be dramatically improved. So, mm -hmm. okay. I'll leave it at that. Okay. It doesn't seem likely to happen. Right. Go ahead. Is it, okay. is it um, would it be your recommendation that the town put a fan on the passive system? It would be my recommendation. Yes, that would dramatically improve indoor air quality, um, and uh, a new owner can take over the monitoring of it, and you know, know that they're doing the right thing uh, by not doing it. Thank you're you. it doesn't pass that straight face test to me. Right. Thank you very much. Certainly. And and. and it to my way of looking at it i i thought that they should do more testing that that they should continue to test because they actually didn't have the the tce and indoor air was not normal so i'd like them to put a would you think that that would be a good idea for them to continue the testing if they put the fan on it then they would do they'd okay. be locked into doing more testing and they'd see the numbers go down and People with that opinion would go, oh, look, see, it's working. It's so much better. Um, lastly, I just have one question about the ball fields. Um, there was uh, metal, et cetera, in the dirt. Did you have any concerns about the, the ball fields for kids? For, or is that uh, not something of a concern? It's not as much of a concern. Um, I think they've taken care of most of the issues in 
um, soil uh, in areas that are open to the public. Okay. Uh, if I could, for the record, uh, they move, they remove something like 62 tons of soil as part mm -hmm. of this process. Yep. There's a lot of dirt got moved. Right. Um, was there any other th thoughts or any other questions for Lyons Wittens, or did you have any other? Con did you have anything else that you wanted to say, Lyons, about? in your review of the remediation process? No, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? I actually have a question, sorry. Um, um, uh, Mary Ann. Is that Sheila? No. No, Mary Ann Bullock. I'm not on the committee officially, so I don't know if I'm, am I able to ask a question at this point? Um, I, I would like to hear it. <laughs> well, I don't think that we are. Oh, um, President Gilmore, are you here? I'm here. So at the chair's discretion, if you are willing to open it up to all residents, then you can hear questions from uh, city councilors who are not on the committee, but it has to apply evenly to everybody. Otherwise, that would be a violation of open meeting law. So if we we're going to add like. I think if it would be better if there was a public comment period, but since this is just a discussion that could continue next month, it might be better um, to have that question sent via email. Just so yeah, there's no, that's that would be. I, I know it's. I, I know that you're very new to the to this, but um, if it could be sent via email and that could be shared with the full council through the clerk's office, we can get answers because we're not making a decision tonight. Okay, yeah, I can send it to Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, I guess that that's it for Lions, unless something else comes back to unless we bring up something else that we would need his attention. I am going to um read into the record the the questions that um, I asked of um, Attorney Schmidt and a, Attorney Schmidt replied to us that because um, he is working on these and he will get the answers to these questions to us, um, but uh, they require a little work on his part. Um, so these were the questions that I asked him. Considering that part of this was a foreclosure and the other part was actually a purchase, does the executive branch actually have the right to sell without city council consent? Secondly, is the CNTS status affected by the fact that we purchased the property? I have copies of the deeds and the original map of the condominium should you need them. There were several residences on Kenwood Forest and Davis Street that had elevated TCE and benzene levels, most likely due to the Lund property. Um, none of these home or goalies garage have had further testing by the LS, by LSP, license site professional from OTO, that's O'Reilly, Talbot and Oaken. So what are the city's liabilities for these and other downgrading properties? Have any of these properties or business owners consented to have their houses exposed to contamination of VOCs? And secondly, do any of these properties have any deed restrictions? Lastly, and importantly, have any of the employees of Behavioral Health Network or Community Support Options and the residents or clients of the treatment facility given their consent to exposure to carcinogenic toxins? What is Greenfield's liability as a city as we had oversight into the remediation of this parcel? In your opinion, is not full remediation of the parcel of the of the property prior to sale the most prudent and judicious approach on behalf of the city and all those in our care? So we'll be expecting those answers from Attorney Schmidt, who um, was delighted to be working on them. Um, so let's see. I just want to read. 
one more thing into the record. Um, we did invite, um, we invited Bruce Nicholson um, um, and he was not able to be here tonight. And um, I'm going to read this from his report from, this was just prior to the opening of um, the detox unit, BH, um, BHN, that would be unit B1. Um, Dear Mayor Martin, as required by 310 CMR 40, this letter is to provide, provided to notify you that O'Reilly Talbot and Oaken Associates Incorporated has submitted a release abatement measure plan to install a subslab depressurization system, SSDS, to address chlorinated solvents in soil and groundwater below the site building to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Agency on behalf of the site owner, the town of Greenfield. We anticipate, anticip we anticipate installation of the SDS, SSDS during the spring and summer construction seasons of 2016. If you have any questions regarding this matter, please contact me and it gives his number. Very truly yours, O'Reilly Talbot and Oak and Associates. And next, I'm going to read into the record. This is from the IRA report um, dated August. Yes, Council Elmer. I can't hear you. You're on mute. The point of the thing you just read is that uh, they had proposed an active system like we just heard about with a fan. And uh, what they put in was a passive system. That's correct. Um, I, I, okay, thank you. Um, and I'm just going to read this from the IRA. That's the two hour um, IRA. This was from August of 2016. Patients began being admitted to the renovated facility during the week of July 11th, 2016. And we understand that due to the high demand for such a facility, it was filled to capacity within approximately one week. Nine indoor air samples were collected over the 24 hour period between July 21st and 22nd, 2016 and analyzed for TCE and associated fluorinated solvents. The sample locations duplicated three basement and one vacant office location first sampled in 2020, 2012. The remaining locations were in the first and second floor office spaces of the occupied Franklin Recovery Center. The indoor air samples are shown on figure three. All the residential rooms were occupied and FRC personnel indicated placement of a sample can canister within an occupied residential room was unacceptable to them. Results of the indoor air analysis are shown in table 1A. That was something that we that Phil had up before, first and second floors. Laboratory results were attached to the IRA plan. The highest concentration were detected in the first floor office at the west end of the building. At this location, 8.7 micrograms of TCE was detected. While this concentration was, was um, below the commercial industrial imminent hazard level of 24, it exceeded the residential imminent hazard concentration of six micrograms per millimeter for TCE. The closest residential room to sample, to a sample location, IA6, is approximately 50 feet east of room 108. While no residential rooms had been able to be tested, the fact that measured concentrations in a building, which includes long-term resident patient care exceeded residential imminent hazard concentrations was conservatively interp interpreted as a potential imminent hazard condition requiring a two-hour notification and immediate response action. 
Mass DEP was notified of the condition at 3.25 p.m. on August 1st, 2016. That's all. That's all I have to say. That is from OTO, who is not here to answer any questions. Um, so, um, any further questions or discussion on this matter from counselors present? I, I, I just have a question about the staff. I have a question about the staff and were they informed? Um, and I guess that's something we may not know. Um, and also the safety of the ball fields. Jenny? Yes. Th are there more, are we gonna hear from anybody else? No, anybody else I invited, um, also invited today was Bruce Nicholson from OTO, um, the, uh, a lawyer, um, Eric Twarog and Marlo Warner, who actually was not, um, Marlo was not, uh, and, oh, but we also have Glenn Ayers. Glenn Ayers is here and Glenn, um, uh, Glenn is a certified health, certified health inspector. Um, he has expertise in this area, and I'm going to let Glenn. Um, I'm going to let Glenn speak, and we're going to have questions for Glenn. Go ahead, take it away, Glenn. I'd like to hear what you think about this site, and any um, if you could enlighten us in any way for any of the topics that were brought up. Thank you, Councillor. Good evening. Um, I, I did bring this to the attention of the city council several meetings ago, and I appreciate this increased focus. Um, my, my first question is, uh, what is the status of the um, public involvement plan that was submitted? A petition was submitted to the city on December 1st. That plan should be well under development by now, but as far as I know, none of the 37 petitioners have been interviewed to this point. So we're we're quite a ways um, quite a ways into the new year, and it appears that nothing has been done. And it seems like um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. There's been very little communication. Uh, one email from the mayor that said that uh, she felt that it was unfortunate that we were getting involved so late in the process because it, things pretty much are done by now. Um, which I completely disagree with. I think that we're very early in the process, even though the phase two, um, the phase two comprehensive site analysis for this property was was submitted, I believe in May of 2012. So it's been 10 years since the since this comprehensive plan or site assessment was submitted, and yet uh, I'm sorry, but there's been a disconnect in the process here. Uh, it should not, uh, contamination like this should not linger for 10 years. There should have been steps taken to prepare a phase three, which would have been an evaluation of the cleanup alternatives. And the goal of this, pro the goal of this process is to reduce the contaminant levels to normal background levels. That's what the goal is. Now, it, that may not be feasible. It may be too expensive. It may be technically not feasible to do that. In which case, then you have to decide if the property can be reused. In some cases, if, if it's impossible to clean up a site like this, it gets a fence put around it. I understand the city doesn't want to do that. So there is a, an amount of money that needs to be spent. Um, in the phase two, uh, OTO disclosed that it would probably take another $200,000 to complete the sampling of the site in order to fully characterize the waste materials prior to doing the phase three, but that should not have taken 10 years to do. Uh, I have not, I have not seen anything related to a phase three, although I know that the lease was mentioned 
And that lease referenced the phase two study. And actually the lease language includes statement. It's in exhibit B. It refers to table 14, which is from the phase two analysis or the phase two comprehensive site assessment. And as part of the lease, it states that all the contaminants will be removed from this site. Mm -hmm. And it also says that there will be installed a groundwater collection and treatment system. And it also says as part of the lease that an active sub slab depressurization system shall be installed. These are all things that are in the lease. I assume that that lease is being renewed year to year. Yet none of those things have been done. Certainly the contaminants have not been reduced to background level or normal background level. So I think what has happened here is that the process stalled for some reason. The, the, the redevelopment of the property went full speed ahead without the concerns that you would, without doing what you would need to do to make an informed decision. An uninformed decision was made to redevelop this property without putting controls in place to contain, control, collect, remediate, and reduce the on-site pollution. And there's, so there's something wrong with the way things have been done. Uh, I would, if it, were, if it were me, I would request formally, request that DEP conduct an audit of this cleanup process. They, they routinely collect information and put it into a repository DEP does not do a lot having to do with this program because it has been privatized through the LSP process. DEP really has very little to do with this unless you request. And if a city requests DEP to do something, they, they will do it. If the city council requested DEP to conduct an audit to try to figure out what went wrong during this process, why were people allowed to occupy a redeveloped site with known contamination and, and be exposed to a known carcinogenic compound that very likely affects their liver metabolism of any of the medications that they're on and any of the treatments that they're undergoing. You know, a toxicologist would look at this and, and pull out their hair. This, this, is, this is just unacceptable. Um, so, so really, my my questions have to do with what is what's happening with the with the public information, the public involvement plan that should take precedent over anything else happening at this site. But it, it again appears that the city is attempting to cover this up or do do something without the proper procedures being followed. And I have very big concerns about that. I don't think that this is the right way to do things. And I believe that this exposes the city to serious liability. Th this is a bodily integrity matter that is a constitutional right, especially when we're dealing with a, a disadvantaged, uh, you know, or a highly susceptible population, such as people in a, in a drug rehab facility uh, to me, this would be a nightmare liability situation for the city. And I, I'm not suggesting that, you know, that we pretend that our hair is on fire, but, but I really think that somebody should take this seriously, mm -hmm. much more seriously than it has been taken. Um, now, I have not read every single document. There's a third, hundred, over a hundred documents on the DEP website. Tens of thousands of pages. I have not read them all, but I've read most of the important ones. And there is a complete disconnect between when the phase two was submitted in 2012 and where we are at today. And mm -hmm. somebody needs to figure out what went wrong because there's something really wrong going on here. That's, uh, that's my editorial comment. Councillor Elmer. Yes, I, I think uh, asking the EPA uh, for an audit uh, is it might be a very good idea. Uh, I, I'm personally, am, I don't disagree that things weren't done 
properly or well. Uh, I'm less interested in assigning blame for that uh, than I am in trying to figure out where we should be going now, uh, how we should proceed. Uh, I, I don't know about the public information process. Um, maybe President Gilmore can can tell us what we what. Uh, is that something that the city does or that the council does? I don't know. Um, uh, so anyway, that the um, so so I, I think I think we I think we all agree that we'd rather not put a fence around it and 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 that. Uh, from the beginning, it seemed like a really good use. There was a crying need for a place uh, for opioid, opioid treatment. And that I can see that people of good faith might think that this was a great idea. Uh, I can see, I'm not an expert, but I can see corners being cut in the process. Uh, the main one being using a passive system rather than an active system. And it may be that, uh, do you disagree that, that Putting the fan in the system now would 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 improve the air quality. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, of course it would improve the air quality. There's no question about that. Um, and and normal radon uh, abatement systems that are installed, you know, pre-construction, and and ones that are that are retrofitted after construction, they normally uh, don't have a fan on them. You retest and if you still detect radon, or in this case, if you still detect TCE, then you would automatically put that on because the goal here is to have zero exposure. The entire goal yeah. of this program is to have zero exposure. There is a risk. This is especially true for, again, pregnant women, fetuses, young children. This is a known carcinogen. It, it's bad stuff, it's been banned. You know, it has it is not used anymore. There are substitutes that are used for this material. Exposure should be limited and eliminated. And the way you could eliminate that is by actually putting in barriers to prevent migration. You know, isolate the contaminant, keep it from migrating off site, which it has done. It has migrated off the property. Those barriers should have been put in immediately and a, a groundwater collection and treatment system should have been put in or an in situ chemical oxidation reduction system should have been put in. Those are the common ways that this material is treated. It would not be an option. Uh, there was a study that was pre that was presented by tie and bond in 2015. I think it was that also said there would be an option to do what's called air sparging or air uh, air volatilization. Um, that's not really an option in a residential neighborhood. Um, you could you could do other treatment systems that would collect the material, but you couldn't just discharge it. But right now, my basic feeling is that the site is uncontrolled. The contaminants are uncontrolled on this site. They did they did remove material down to the groundwater table, but based on the based on the soil characteristics which were analyzed, they brought in a, a professional soil evaluator. Alan Weiss, who I know, and I've, I've been on many, many perk tests with him. Um, he evaluated the site and said that the water table comes to within two feet of the ground surface and that it fluctuates between, I think it was five to seven feet seasonally. So in that case, the contaminant is moving up and down on top of the water table and coating all of those soil particles. And so it's an uncontrolled situation. and. And depending upon where the water table is and a lot of other factors that are very complicated, the materials can move in different directions at different times of the year. Um, and then there was a lot of stormwater surface water management that was done that could also impact that. There's sub, there's sub parking lot uh, surface water storage retention under the parking lots. All of those things are impacting the way the water table moves on the property. And in my opinion, the, the contaminants on this site are currently uncontrolled. There is a lack mm -hmm. of control. And that would be the first thing that you would wanna do is control things and then make your evaluations on what the remediation, what the long-term use of this property would be. But that was all short-circuited. 
There was an end run done around that process and the site was redeveloped, in my opinion, extremely prematurely before the proper steps were taken. Now, I agree, we are here now, but we have to deal with what we have right now. And so I don't appreciate the fact that there's this attempt to ignore, um, you know, the, the preparation of the, the public involvement plan. I, I don't think that the mayor is, is taking this seriously. And I understand that a lot of decisions were made. She, she has acknowledged that a lot of these decisions were made by the previous administration. Fine. There's nothing she can do about that, but what she can do is she can take the actions that should have been taken and that need to be taken now based on the existing conditions on that property. And again, I think that if she lacks doing that, then she will bear responsibility. Thank you. Yeah, so I had a brief comment and also a question. Um, so yesterday my, was my one week anniversary as council president. So I don't know if anyone from the executive is going to um, involve me in the, the, the PIP. Um, it's possible that I would be involved and they haven't reached out to me yet. I mean, it's, you know, this week's flown by and there's been a lot. I do have a quote. Oh, and I will keep people posted if um, she reaches out to me about that. I do have a question, though. Um, Glenn, you had mentioned earlier that it shouldn't have taken 10 years. And just for context, because I'm not a soil scientist, I don't have a background in public health. I'm really not a hard sciences kind of a person. I'm more of a social sciences person. For context, what do you think would have been a reasonable time frame? And what would have been, you know, so this reasonable and then there's like, this is what we can do if we really like made it a goal and made it a priority. This is how long it would take. Can you kind of give me. Yeah, some yep. estimates? so um, the, the basic rule of thumb uh, in, in the DEP regulations or their timeline, it looked it, it envisions a 6 year process. For this for the entire process to go through, but it's really dependent. It's site specific. It's site dependent. This is actually a very small site compared to many. Many hazardous waste sites are extensive. You know, we're talking about hundreds of acres, sometimes thousands of acres. So this is a very, very small site. It would have been easy to contain the contaminants properly and to come up with a remediation plan in a in a very short, you know, it, really um, within months. Um, there's no reason to have 10 years go by between the phase two and the phase three. My understanding is that there is no intention to do a phase three. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but my my understanding is that right now the LSP intends to propose a permanent solution using a AUL going through this process of uh, claiming that it is a industrial use and trying to trying to finagle and fudge and bend the uh, the standards to allow. Uh, ongoing contamination in perpetuity without mm -hmm. consent, without any consent from the people that are on the property or even into the neighboring uh, residences. And that it, that's unacceptable. I'm sorry. That is just unacceptable. I saw um, Lyons, you I, I saw, had your hand up and then uh, Council Elmer. Go ahead. The, the DEP does put a, a six year timeline out that they try to get everybody to uh, fit within. Um, I did want to, I wanted to correct one thing. Uh, 10 years ago, there was a phase two. Um, and again, in April of 2020, there was another phase two. So they did a phase two report twice. So the most recent phase two report was April of 2020, uh, but you're correct in that no phase three evaluation of remedial alternatives was ever done, um, at least not um, submitted publicly where it could be uh, reviewed. And yes, they do seem to be moving very quickly toward um, closing the site with an activity and use limitation uh, we heard at the beginning of the evening tonight that we're in the middle of a 30-day uh, 
period. And when that's up, they're going to file it. And at that point, um, that's pretty close to closure. And the the PIP will, I don't know what will happen with a PIP after the site's actually closed. It would be far more effective if the, if the mayor held off on actual closure and, and uh, followed through on allowing the PIP process to happen or a, a DEP audit to happen if that was requested by the city. Um, the city mm -hmm. requesting an audit of its own actions, which is what you're asking, um, would be an right. interesting, um, it'll be interesting to see if how DEP reacted to that. So that's all I wanna say. Uh, Council Elmer. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the letter, Bruce Nicholson's letter of uh, December 2nd, 2021, a month ago, uh, asking for uh, a six month extension for the submittal of the phase three and phase four reports. He mentions working on an uh, activity and use limitation um, uh, and then says that uh, Everything's been uh, complicated by the presence of separate condominium units within the disposal site boundaries, extensive title work, a municipal owning of the property under an operating agreement with a private developer, and the coordination of duties and responsibilities. I'm not sure what that buys him with the uh, that that's sent to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. So to answer the question about the phase three is they've asked for a six month extension. I'm, I'm not surprised that that was submitted the day after we submitted the public involvement plan, but it's still, <laughs> I think that was not a coincidence. Interesting. If, if the mayor is still here, perhaps the, and I'm going to go back, perhaps the mayor would like to speak to the public involvement plan. Is the mayor still on? Let me just look. Well, that someone said that the mayor had to leave. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. We'll take that up at another time. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Lyons, have you had any experience with the public involvement plans in, in your background? Yeah, we've worked on several public involvement plans. Um, I'm not sure why they're filing an activity and use limitation if they're not planning to close the site, filing a, placing an AUL on a property and then doing phase three seems a little backwards. Okay. There's no real point in putting an activity and use limitation on a property unless you're trying to close it. Uh, it doesn't get you anything, so I don't, um, the April 2020 report talks about needing the AUL for closure, and if the city placed the AUL, then they could have closure. Right. So now they're filing the AUL, and I understand the most recent letter says that phase three, phase four is coming. Um, so what's the rush on the AUL? I don't understand that. That doesn't process wise so, doesn't make any sense to me. I apologize if this sounds like an ignorant question, but I thought that the public improvement plan meant that everything had to go on hold while we brought the public into this. And if I'm wrong, someone please correct me. No, you're correct. That is correct. The, the city cannot do anything until the public involvement plan is in a draft form. They have to hold a hearing with 14 days of notice, has to be published in the newspaper. They have to accept comments on that plan, and then they have to incorporate those comments to the extent practicable into the final public involvement plan. And then the plan gets implemented. It gets put in place, which requires tw at least 20 day comment periods on all significant steps going forward in this process. It's a very extensive, it's actually a very well written uh, way to have the public involved in these exact for this exact reason. Um, normally, this is not done with cities. 
Normally, this is a private owner, an industry that owns a property that's contaminating a neighborhood. It, in this case, the city took this property for the back taxes, which somebody gave them bad, very bad advice to, to take this property before it was cleaned up. Because there was a, there was a responsible party um, for this contamination. And the city assumed that responsibility for cleaning it up when they took the property for back taxes. Uh, that was, in my opinion, bad decision. I would, I would never recommend a town purchase a known contaminated site unless the finances came along with it. Um, now, the city does have better access to federal and state grant funding for sure. And so that may be uh, the reason why they did it. But we are nowhere near uh, the end of the process as the mayor contends. We are not even in the middle of the process at this point. We're closer to the beginning. Then we are Thank you. Them. Councilor Elmer. Hey, just for the record, uh, at an earlier meeting about this, uh, we had a statement, uh, maybe it was in writing from uh, Assistant Mayor Letourneau, that the responsibility for, the legal responsibility for the cleanup after the sale goes to the buyer. Uh, I don't know, but I just wanted to throw that in because that's, that seems to be the, the position of the city. Also, uh, tell me a little bit more about the AUL. Is that prepared for the buyer or the seller? It's a deed restriction, essentially, and it would be enforced by the building inspector. Um, it goes onto the deed, and essentially it would limit the use of the property so that it could never be used for residential purposes because it had not been cleaned up to the residential standard, which is the case here. And so then we get into this conflict between uh, what standards apply in this case, and the fact that the intention is to per perpetually expose people to a known carcinogenic compound without mm -hmm. control, without proper controls. In my in my opinion, just looking at the numbers, which are not statistically valid to do any kind of an analysis on, there are far too too few samples and far too many variables. Um, I'm not going to say it's meaningless, but it indicates. And Sheila caught it right away. It indicates that there is no control on this site. There is no contaminant control on the site. The levels went up after the system was installed. And, mm -hmm. and that means that there is no consistency. They cannot claim that the system that they installed is actually performing. And yes, it would perform better, but I don't know how much better if you put a fan on it. I would want to have no detection. That's how I would be sure that the system was functioning properly. You would have no detection of TCE inside the building because you're depressurizing under the slab. And mm -hmm. instead of gases leaking from a point of high concentration to a point of lower concentration, that means going through any of the perforations in the building into the indoor airspace, the indoor airspace would be pulled out of the building and into the sub slab, which is being depressurized. If it was installed properly, you would have no detection once you turn that fan on. That would be the goal. The goal of this is zero exposure. That's the goal of this. Now that, that should be the bottom line for a site that has been prematurely redeveloped. Zero exposure of anyone inside those buildings. And they need to put a system, install, install a system now retrofitted if necessary to ensure that there's zero exposure and it needs to be monitored and it needs to be it needs to have remote telemetry put on it according to the regulations so that so that they can be monitored and known if that system gets turned off because if that fan gets turned off if it fails if the power supply goes out something whatever then the system is no longer functioning so so there's a lot that has to be done yet on this property i'm just it's 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 clear a lot more needs to be done and the public needs to be involved in every step of it because I, personally i do not trust the consultant who has been advising the town i just don't trust them you know i i've dealt with consultants for 40 years and some of them are great and some of them you just have to watch and you you can't trust them if you turn your back for a second so i don't trust the current 
uh, LSP on this site for, I think, valid reasons. Um, I, I share many of your concerns. Um, I found it unusual that they promised to put something in with telemetry monitoring, that that didn't happen. And then the estimate for I think the estimate was for a million dollars in remediation costs, and we spent about half of that. Um, I think that says a lot. That was just a, that was an estimate over eight years ago. So um, I, I personally, within a half an hour of reading this, uh, it was a night in March, I looked at it and thought, there's something not right here. Um, so that's my take on it. Um, any, any further questions? Um, any further questions? Yes. I, I, I guess I would ask you, um, where do you see us going from here? Uh, me? Yeah. Are we going to get the other, um, are we going to get the people who are invited? Are they going to show up at another meeting? Um, I don't know whether they will be coming or not. You can, we certainly can ask them to our next economic development meeting. I don't know if, um, uh, well, that would, would be, yes. If or, I can butt in for a moment, absolutely. I would like to keep this on the agenda for at least as long as we have a PIP, because I feel like the city council owes it to the residents that if we're going to have the public participating, this is the public forum to discuss this issue. So I think we're gonna have to keep at least that part of the discussion alive. Mm -hmm. um, as other issues resolve themselves, which hopefully other, I mean, we all want this to be resolved. So as other things become resolved, it'll be a um, hopefully a, a less dense discussion and we can just focus on what's in front of us for now. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, I think that if, you know, well, I, I think that, you know, and I don't no spoilers or anything, but I think that we are going to have a new chair next month. Um, so if the current chair and, and the newer chair could sort of work together on how we're going to move forward with this, I think that would be really helpful. Um, because this is not something that I think we're going to resolve tonight. We're certainly not voting tonight. Agreed. Agreed. Um, do any of our uh, scientific experts here have anything else that they wanted to share before? Um, no. I'll just say that, um, if I can, that yes. I am, I am, I live in this town. I live very close to the one property. I am, I have a background in this sort of stuff and especially in public health. And I feel very strongly that the Board of Health needs to be involved in this process. They should have been involved all along. They should have been giving their opinion. They should have signed off on any certificates of occupancy that were issued for this property. They should have had made findings about the safety. And I'm not saying that to be critical of the Board of Health. I'm just saying that that is the normal process that should be followed. And if it hadn't been, pro been followed, and I don't think there is any evidence that it was followed in the past, but we'll see. Uh, but going forward, I believe that the Board of Health should be fully involved in this to represent public health and community health. That's their job. Right. Um, and, and I feel very strongly about that. And I personally am at your disposal. I will offer whatever I can to uh, this committee and to the city council. I, I can understand if you don't want to accept what I say, but I'm offering that to you uh, as a uh, an expert uh, in public health and with a background in site cleanup, uh, and and it's free, so it's worth <laughs> what you pay for it. But but um, but I'm availing myself to you. Yeah, and Thank to provide you. some context, um, recognizing that other than people who may have formally served on the city council, I'm the longest serving counselor on this call right now. And I remember when I was a brand new counselor, when 
there were budget cuts um, in, in public health. And um, there we're, we're seeing the ramifications from that. And I think that, you know, we've got Jennifer Hoffman right now. We had Valerie Bird um, briefly. And I think that turnover doesn't help with these things. Um, I was asking about documents earlier, and I think that we're going to have to do a little bit of homework and some follow-up there because these documents must exist. And if we don't have them as recipients, because I understand that some people don't keep records very well, um, hopefully the senders would have some sort of record that they had sent us mm -hmm. these documents. Um, and that being said, like, like Councillor Elmer said earlier, let's not worry about who's to blame for what happened in the past. What we need to do is worry about our future. We're going to worry about our present. Hopefully we can clean up this property, make sure everybody is safe, and we'll do it cooperatively and as soon as humanly possible is what I would like to see. Very good. Well, th thank you one and all. Um, thank you one and all. So I am... Um, Without further ado, I'm going to go on to. Uh, actually, I I'm I'm going to thank our speakers, and I'm going to go on to uh, one of the things that I missed at the beginning, and then new business, no old business. Uh, is that amenable to everyone? Oh yes, Lions. Okay, you're saying good night. All right. Um, very okay. good. Thank you. Thank I love you. your plants, by the way. <laughs> very good. Make sure they go to good night rest. Uh, I'd just like to say I, I'm I'm eager to hear from the other side. Uh, we've we've had some very articulate explanations of of uh, what the risks are and what the problems are. Uh, there are people who have been following the story from the beginning that we should hear from. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, and I hope absolutely because there's yeah. If, it, yeah, if there's if, if there are uh, projects that have been ongoing that we don't know about because none of us have crystal balls, and right now we don't have everybody on the call, that's definitely part of this discussion. I think that's right. important. Very good. Um, so I eliminated the minutes at the beginning. I skipped over that. Um, uh, Bye. Yeah. Goodbye. Um, could I have a motion to approve the minutes from the last month's meeting? So moved. Uh, I'll second that. Okay. And so all in favor? Aye. Aye. I abstain. Okay. Um, was there any new business? Any old business? Okay. Our next meeting, the next meeting of the Economic Development Committee will be February 8th at uh, 6 p.m. And I will take a motion. I'm just taking, checking the date to make sure I get that right. February 8th. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Uh, before I move that, oh, yes. I just want to thank uh, the president for all the work she's put in over the last year. Uh, he really uh, done yeoman's work, and uh, we wouldn't know any of this if you hadn't done it. So thank you. And I will move that we adjourn. Oh, do you mean the chair? Yeah, the chair. Sorry. I don't, the... I don't know Sheila. if you just like gave me credit for all of Ginny's work or if you just promoted Ginny. What what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> I meant to I meant to thank Ginny. Uh, but Sheila, thank you for all your work too. In the last eight days, I've been working like a dog. <laughs> okay. Uh, so oh, I move you. that we adjourn. All right, very good. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And thank you, thank you, everybody. And thanks for Phil with the technical. All right. Good night now. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.